it's going to take more in jobs to bring this economy back. We've got to bring out on the table what income and wealth inequality means to this country. This increasing inequality is most pronounced in our country, and it challenges the very essence of who we are as a people. How can we say that this is the greatest country in the world, where people in Braddock are starving? Yeah, everything's changed. The whole economy has changed. Most of the wealth in this country is in the hands of a few. Salaries haven't changed all that. And I thought to myself, is that a bad thing? <laughs> they really believe that the only way they can get that if there's someone else who's struggling more than them. We will make America strong again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America great again. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. I can't wait for him to get out of here. I cannot wait for him to get out. When I first got out of Vietnam in the Army, I came back here and jobs were, were plentiful. I went to the mill and I, I worked there for a little while. Then I went to part-time police and uh, constable and I got my own landscaping business. Braddock used to have three or four movie theaters, five or six car dealerships. It was a bustling town, but it was all because the middle class that the steel mills made, that's gone. I don't know if you heard of Century 3 Mall. Out of 50 to 100 stores, they all moved out. Now it's a big complex of empty buildings. And that's just because the people weren't going there and shopping anymore because people didn't have the money to shop. Three generations of my family, my great-grandfather, my father and father all worked in Andrew Carnegie's first steel mill. As the mill began to decline, that's when this area, it became very deteriorated. It was left abandoned and neglected by the society, by the government. You used to have thousands of workers here, probably over 100,000 workers just in the steel industry or with the technology you know you're going to eventually just go downward in those numbers you know and it's really made these areas suffer and people are just moving away because there's nothing here the younger kids you can't blame them they, they graduate from school and they get out of here In 1970, 60% of U.S. adults lived in middle-income households. Currently, it's about 50%. And this movement is both up and down the economic ladder. So what we have is a process of economic polarization. More people at the low end, more people at the high end, fewer people in the middle. And it's a reflection of growing economic inequality. Our town relied on a steel mill for a really long time, and for a long time that bank rolled everything that we had here. But now what we see, blighted buildings and not a lot of jobs, not a lot of job opportunities and educational disparities. Also, we see a concentration of poor people, black people, um, and kind of the intersection of both of those. The loss of industrial jobs in the United States has been happening now for decades. And so, in many ways, the great U.S. middle class was built on people moving out of industry. And a lot of industrial jobs are dangerous, lots of safety accidents, and they are, there are limits on how much one can pay. Anybody puts time into the mills, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't do it. I lasted six months and told them to shove it because they had me under in a, in the tunnels underneath the, the core room and it was dirty, nasty. My dad worked there for 46 years and he, he eventually died from uh, asbestos in his lungs. 
and finally went to his brain and killed him. You know, it is hot and hard work. I don't know if you've ever been in a steel mill before, but you know, once you get into your 60s, this work becomes very hard if you're not a crane operator or you're maybe not in a pulpit operating. I mean, it would be very hard to do that. In 1979, I worked for the company Westinghouse Electric, and I made $8 an hour then. And fast forward, <laughs> 35 years later, UPMC started me off at $8.50. And we all know the cost of living has changed dramatically. What we have here is um, at the right to work states, uh, basically where you can't unionize and you'll see that the pay is tremendously lower. You don't have benefits, you have no pensions. You, there's no real way to support yourself after you retire. And that would force everybody to work pretty much their entire life. Now you go to the grocery store, you get five bags of groceries for $100. Used to be $10 a bag. You know, now people, if they don't get help with their taxes and with their, their rent, their gas and their electric from the government programs, they're in, they're in trouble. Because living paycheck to paycheck is, it's rough. Incomes have been growing at a very low pace for the working classes. In the U.S. you have the entire bottom half of the population that, this, that was completely shut off from economic growth. 3% growth for the bottom 50% between 1980 and today. 3% growth is nothing over a period of uh, 38 years. It's tough to keep up with the bills. And one of the worst things is having medical debt to the company that you work for. Do you have one? Medical debt to yeah. UPMC? Yes, I have some. Most people who work there have medical debt that they owe to the employer. Why do we even have to pay for health care when we work for the biggest health care provider in the state? Can we honestly say that we have a middle class? When you look at just the out of control, you know, income inequality that we have in this country, when we look at, you know, our top earners in society, you know, when we look at our billionaires, and then we can imagine that someone walking down the street in Braddock could, you know, have housing that's not consistent, that we have people who make seven twenty-five an hour because that's what our minimum wage is. The middle class isn't shrinking, it's almost non-existent. Because of the rising in income inequality, uh, economists are starting to take a harder look at the question. And one of the consequences is that economic growth itself may be negatively impacted. That as a result of rising income inequality, you end up with slower economic growth in the country. That is because demand in the economy falls. You have more income flowing into the hands of people who are less likely to spend it. You know, you gotta sometimes choose between having medication or food. <laughs> it's not fair, I mean, the inequality is just, it's tough. It's tough, I mean, it's hard to make it working as an everyday person. Clearly Trump was elected on an agenda to make the economy work for the bottom 50% of the American population. What he's doing in terms of the economy is clearly going against the objective interests of the bottom 50% of the American population. This tax cuts is, uh, you know, is a clear proof that what he's really interested in is you know, the growth rates of the top 0.1%. He could use dog whistles for making America great. Um, which harkens us back to a time where black people, where immigrants, or people of color, you know, weren't able to avail themselves of the same opportunities. You know, that's what we're seeing in this town. These are the people who never thought that America was great in the way that they're saying, because we've always known inequality. In any country, if there are economic problems, the easiest thing for a politician to do is blame someone else. We're doing badly because those people are cheating. 
those people are stealing our jobs. All of these kinds of uh, caricatures of uh, globalization, I think, are uh, largely uh, uh, untrue, largely fabricated, but has now become a uh, dangerous part of our global narrative because it's undercutting many of the forces and structures of the global economy, like international trade, which have actually been the bedrock for progress everywhere. I think a heightened fear of losing control, losing power, of, of the mass of power and rule and domination over everything, and I think that's what's fueling the populism. And what that does is it pits people who should be natural allies, poor people, working class people of all races, of all backgrounds, it pits us against each other because we're fighting for that one slice of the pie when in reality, the wealthy, the top 1%, they have their own pie, they have the factory. Uh, if, we, if you look at you know, American foreign policy today, we are already beyond this era of uh, supposedly happy globalization, of multilateralism. And one of the problem is that uh, what globalization had promised, you know, largely failed. It was supposed to increase the living standards in uh, low-income countries, it did so. But it was also supposed to increase the living standards of the middle class and of the working classes in rich countries, which didn't really do so. We're seeing people who are wanting to come back to this neighborhood. We're seeing businesses that are starting to want to come here, but also we still have pollution. We still have the highest rates of asthma and COPD or respiratory illnesses. And on top of that, we also have a fracking proposal. I'm afraid that Braddock won't recover. I'm afraid that this region won't because no one's gonna wanna live in a dying town. So I think it's quite a natural phenomenon to see people experimenting and saying, well, do something for us here. And I think that what we will uh, see over the next few years is whether governments can deliver on that or not. They will be trying to have policies outweigh market forces. And that's not an easy thing to do. That's the American story, though. <laughs> it's like the American dichotomy. It's like freedom for all, but also, you know, poverty, also slavery, also vast inequality. And it's always kind of existed together. And you will see that nowhere else. Like, you will see that no better than a place like this, than Braddock. Why are we trying to preserve this particular system? Why are we okay with preserving inequality, vast inequality for the most vulnerable people? A town like Braddock shouldn't exist. Not in this country. Somebody has to profit though. We have a profit-driven country that relies on people in my community being poor. If the trend keeps going like this, it's gonna be more an anarchy. You're gonna have a war right here. The rich against the poor. These people aren't gonna take it too much longer. It's amazing that they, they're taking as much as they have. You gotta start taking care of the people because if the people are, are the ones that are making everything, at least treat them right. Uh, give, them, give them a break, something. on check